Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone welcome to the course on medical biomaterials we will continue on the topic of analytical tools. Yesterday uh, I introduced uh, something called spectroscopy, there are different types of spectroscopies, almost 7 or 8 different techniques which is widely used in um, analytical chemistry, organic chemistry, but in biomaterials we do not use all those spectroscopies, but some of them are used. So, we will just introduce some of those. Um, the one that is uh, quite a lot used commonly is fluorescent spectroscopy. What happens is you take the sample and then um, there is a light source, both the excitation spectrum that is the light that is absorbed by the sample and or the emission spectrum that is the light that is emitted by the sample can be measured. So, we can measure both the light uh, excitation as well as uh, the emission. So, we can measure the concentration of the analyte uh, that is present in the sample which is directly proportional to the intensity of the emission. Okay. So, uh, uh, at different concentrations you will get different intensities. So, we can draw a standard graph and uh, we can um, indirectly later on con calculate concentration of uh, the analyte um, from the um, intensity of the light. So, this is useful. Uh, if I want to monitor a metabolite and so on actually. Okay. Ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, this is also very useful. Uh, what happens is absorption spectroscopy or reflectance spectroscopy in the ultraviolet or the visible spectral region. So, we are looking at either at the ultraviolet or the visible. So, we can uh, monitor if there are any chromophores. What is a chromophore? Um, some a, a functional group like C double bond C or C triple bond C or C double bond O, um, aromatic groups, N double bond O and so on. These are called chromophores. Okay. So, they have certain characteristic uh, wave length. So, we can monitor them. So, we can know whether the chromophores are present in a sample. We can also determine what is the amount of those. Okay. Uh, generally, when we talk about UV and visible, we are talking in this region 200 to 800 nanometers only. So, how does it work? So, we have uh, um, a lamp deuterium tungsten lamp, then there is a monochromator um, the light passes through the sample and it is detected. We have a reference here. So, with respect to the reference we can monitor whether a chromophore is present at what concentration. So, generally uh, if you look at uh, the uh, spectroscope spectrogram it will look like this at a particular lambda max. And as I said that lambda max is characteristic of the type of chromophore present. So, you may get a nice looking um, spectrogram like this. So, we can measure from this absorbance what is the concentration if you have a standard graph and this lambda max is an indication of what type of chromophore that is present. So, it uses the beer Lambert's law. If you remember in your uh, school days um, or 12 standard days it is given as absorbance equal to some constant called absorptivity coefficient, the path length that is this length into the concentration of the analyte. So, <coughs> uh, from the absorbance we can calculate analyte concentration or from the analyte concentration we can calculate absorbance. So, this is also a very useful technique. Um, when is it used? For example, I am looking at the um, biofilms that are formed on uh, implants or devices and I want to know what type of material is present and what at what concentration I can scrape the biofilm into a solution I can do a UV visible spectroscopy. Okay. So, these are quite useful um, both uh, which I talked about the fluorescence as well as the UV visible spectroscopy um, to, uh, to monitor the composition of the biofilm. Then comes uh, something called the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. FTIR Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. This is extremely powerful where we can look at uh, material surfaces. For example, if there are any ketonic group present on a surface like on a polymer or if there are any hydroxyl present or amino present either polymer or metals 
or even uh, an uh, oxides, uh, this is very powerful. If uh, I have a biofilm that is deposited on the polymer, I want to know whether there are amide groups um, that are present, I can use this. So, this is a very useful technique for looking at surfaces as well as uh, the deposit, the organic deposit on the surface. Okay? So, it is called FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. This is very useful technique. Okay, so, what happens is uh, <coughs> when an IR radiation is passed through a sample, some of it is absorbed by the sample and some is transmitted. The resultant signal is a molecular fingerprint because uh, atoms which are connected through bonds start vibrating, um, there is a bending. So, these vibrational frequencies are very characteristics of the type of functional groups that are present. For example, if there is a OH type of functional group, it will vibrate at certain frequency or wave number. Uh, if there are ketonic group like C double bond O, it is very characteristic and so on actually. So, uh, this is the setup of an IR. Uh, so, we have the sample, there is an IR source, okay. um, there is a fixed mirror, moving mirror, then there is a detector. Um, so, this is a typical uh, spectrogram. So, we have the wave number that is centimeter inverse here in the x axis and this is called the percentage transmission. So, we have uh, um, as you can see some bands around um, 2900, there are some bands at uh, 1400, there are some bands at 1700 and there are some bands at uh, uh, 700 centimeter inverse. So, all these bands are characteristic of a uh, functional group. So, um, I can look at uh, from, from the literature. I can say what type of functional groups are present. Okay. So, if I am doing some surface modification, some of these bands could disappear, I may be forming some new bands. So, I can tell what type of surface modification I am doing, um, whether the surface modification is successful. So, that way IR is extremely useful. Okay. So, um, each functional group has certain characteristic uh, um, wave number uh, in centimeter inverse. So, I need to know that data. For example, as you can see alkyl, alkanyl, alkanyl C double bond O, alkanyl, then you have C triple bond, aromatic, uh, aromatic carbon, C double bond, C aromatic, alcohols, phenols, carboxylic acid, amines, nitriles, aldehydes, ketones, esters, carboxylic acid, the C double bond O, so and so on actually. So, you can see um, on this side we have the characteristic absorption wave number centimeter inverse. So, for example, the C double bond O of an aldehyde happens at 1740 to 1690, C double bond O of ketone is 1750 to 1680, the C double bond O of ester is 1750 to 1735. So, it may it is bit difficult to determine whether the C double bond O signal is because of a carbonyl or ester or aldehyde, but uh, if you have a peak or sorry a band at 1720, 1730 and so on. So, we can be sure that there is a C double bond O. Similarly, um, if you have around 3500 plus, uh, we can be sure there is an alcohol or a phenolic uh, OH present. So, if you have around 2500 to 3000, we can say there is an OH from a carboxylic acid. If you have 3700, 3500 that range, we can be sure there is a NH. Okay. So, if you have 1690, 1630, then there could be amide. Okay. If you are looking at amine, you can have 3500, 3300. Uh, if you have nitrile, 22, 60, 22, 20. So, by looking at uh, the uh, characteristic band, we can find out what type of functional groups or we can predict what type of functional groups that are present in the um, surface. Okay. Generally, this is a surface phenomena which we are monitoring. And if some uh, may do a surface modification and some bands disappear, we can say that particular functional group has taken part in the surface modification process. Okay. So, that way this is a very useful technique. Um, so, this is a typical uh, say for example, FTIR I am showing here of some uh, hyper branched uh, polyglycerol. Okay. So, as you can see here lot of OH because polyglycerol, glycerol contains lot of OH we can see here. Okay. And then uh, 1653 here, here this is the CH2 of the bending of the hyper branched. So, this is a very simple polymer. 
So, we can uh, see this. Suppose there are ketonic group uh, then you may have a peak around 17, 20 that is ketonic is C double bond O ok. And if you are getting uh, nitrile nit and so on you may have it much lower and so on. So, we can monitor uh, the presence of certain functional groups uh, from these uh, bands ok. So, here the x axis is wave number and the y axis is generally transmitted ok. So, FTIR is a very useful technique um, uh, to find out what type of functional groups are present in that polymer or a metal or a ceramic and uh, if I am making modifications uh, how these functional group gets affected. Sometimes when there is a bonding these um, bands get shifted then we can say these bands are taking part in the um, reaction ok. So, FTIR is extremely useful in the area of a biosurface uh, uh, measurement. Similarly, just like FTIR there is something called FT Raman, it also probes the molecular vibration. So, it is called inelastic scattering of incident radiation due to its interaction with the vibrating molecules. So, here the scattered light having a frequency different from that of the incident light and that is used to construct a Raman spectra ok. So, basically Raman spectra arises due to inelastic collision between incident monochromatic radiation and the molecule. So, we have a um, monochromatic radiation it hits the molecule, molecules are vibrating ok. So, it produces uh, um, scattered light having a frequency different from that of the incident light. So, that is the Raman spectrum. So, changes in chemical bonding as when a substrate is added to an enzyme, uh, we can look at polymers, we can look at biomolecules, peptides, proteins and so on. So, FT Raman is very useful if you are looking at uh, biofilm formation where the biofilm contains lot of uh, proteinaceous uh, material ok. So, with the help of FT Raman, FTIR we can try to probe the surfaces of um, several materials. So, these tools are widely used for surface engineering or surface modification. Then comes mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry is very useful to uh, determine the mass especially if I have a polymeric material I can find out what is the mass of the polymer. If I have a biofilm with lot of proteins, I can get some idea about what type of protein uh, are uh, uh, present on the surface ok. Uh, so, mass spectrometer is very useful there. So, what happens is it calculates the mass to charge ratio of molecules using electrical and magnetic field ok. So, molecules are ionized first and then they are focused and they are sent to the detector or the mass analyzer. So, the ionization is the first step the molecules are ionized. So, there are different ways of ionizing molecules, um, one is you bombard the molecule with electrons or you can bombard the molecule with chemical or we can spray the molecule at high voltage or we can use uh, a matrix material which in turn ionizes the molecules that is called the matrix assisted laser desorption. So, there are so many different ways by which molecules can be ionized. Unless you ionized and charge the molecule, it will not be focused onto a detector using electrical or magnetic fields. So, neutral molecules cannot be focused. So, we need to ionize the molecule. So, how do you ionize? Different techniques electron impact, that is called EI, chemical ionization, CI, electron spray, ESI, matrix assisted laser desorption, this is called MALDI. So, these are principal methods by which ionization of the uh, molecules are done. So, once the molecules are ionized um, they can be uh, focused um, using electric and magnetic field onto a analyzer. So, different types of analyzers are there magnetic, quadrupole, quadrupole ion trap, time of flight. Fourier transform ion cyclotron and so on actually. We will not spend too much time, time of flight is widely used, sometimes ion trap is also used, those are mass analyzer. So, um, molecules initially are uh, separated using a uh, liquid chromatography or uh, HPLC high pressure liquid chromatography, then they are ionized and then they are focused on to a analyzer. That way we can get a molecular weight of uh, a mixture of uh, say enzymes or proteins or even small molecules natural products. That means, uh, with mass spec I can get molecular weights of uh, in the order of 1000 or I can get molecular weights in the order of uh, 
20, 30, 40,000. So, it is very versatile um, instrument um, and it is used by organic chemists, synthetic chemists, natural product chemists, um, proteomics, uh, biologists and so on actually. Okay. So, what does it contain? There is a chromatography for separating various uh, components. Uh, so, it could it is a liquid chromatography. We can you also use a gas chromatography. Okay. So, it can be LC or it can be GC. So, there could be in liquid chromatography column and solvent, in a GC it could be column and gases. Then you do the ionization, like I said uh, uh, you can use electron, you can uh, by bombarding or we can use electron spray or we can use a matrix assisted uh, laser desorption and ionization technique. So, all these are possible. Then you have the mass analyzer, quadrupole, ion trap, time of flight and finally, we have the detector where it is the electronics. So, the ions go and bombard, current is produced. So, we get the mass of the particular molecule. It can be a protein or it can be a small molecule. Okay. Uh, now, uh, let us look at each one of them little bit in more detail. So, we can have hybrid gas chromatograph mass spec, liquid chromatograph mass spec, gas chromatograph infrared, liquid chromatograph NMR. So, we can have many different types of these are called hybrid techniques, hyphenated technique. So, we can have uh, liquid chromatograph and the mass spec. So, both are possible. Now, um, how does this HPLC or liquid chromatograph works? Uh, we will not spend any time on this. Um, the separation is based on the analytes relative solubility between two phases. So, we have a um, bonded phase or stationary phase, we have the solvent phase or the liquid phase. So, the analyte gets uh, either adsorbed or partitioned. Um, so, there is an interaction. So, the separation of the various uh, components take place. So, we get each component separately which can be introduced into the mass spec and the molecular weight of that component could be determined. Okay. That is how um, these uh, LC or HPLC help uh, you to uh, separate the components. Okay. So, in uh, HPLC or LC we have the normal phase uh, that means, the normal phase is a polar stationary phase and the uh, solvent could be a non-polar solvent. Whereas, when you have a reverse phase uh, the stationary phase could be non-polar okay, or a hydrophobic material whereas, the polar solvent uh, could be water, acetonitrile combinations of these and thereof actually. So, we can have a reverse phase uh, um, liquid chromatograph or we can have a normal phase liquid chromatograph. Okay. So, typically uh, the HPLC instrument will look like this. We have a um, column where you have the stationary phase, uh, we can inject the sample here. The mobile phase could be one single solvent or it could be many solvents okay. and then it is pumped inside and uh, it goes here to the detector after the separation. The detector could be your mass spectrometer which I showed you before okay, like this, okay, like this. Okay. This whole thing the detector could be mass spectrometer. Okay. So, typically uh, what comes out of the column HPLC column or a liquid chromatographic column is uh, uh, peaks of various components separated out like this you know. So, this we can say a very large component A and uh, another component B and we also have maybe C, D, E and so on which are of uh, smaller con maybe of smaller concentration. So, each one is introduced into the uh, mass spec and the molecular weight of each one of these components could be determined in the mass spec. This is how the um, combination of HPLC and uh, mass spec works. Now, what is the difference between HPLC and liquid chromatograph? HPLC and uh, LC. LC is much smaller than HPLC um, with respect to the internal diameter of the column okay, and also with respect to the flow rate. Okay. Uh, whereas, HPLC may have higher flow rate and it may have a larger diameter column. Uh, if you look at LCMS, generally the column size could be 1 mm, whereas in HPLC the column size that is diameter could be 4.6 mm. And, uh, of course, um, we can also have capillary columns which is of 300 micrometer or 75 micrometer capillary columns and the flow rate in LC could be even 100 nanoliter. Okay. 
So, the flow rates in a liquid chromatograph can be very, very low, whereas in HPLC the flow rates are much higher and the column diameter is also much higher. Okay. So, we will not spend too much time on that. So, the HPLC or the LC is the uh, initial um, front end where the various components are separated out. It could be a mixture of proteins, it could be a mi mixture of metabolites okay. and then these enter the gas chromatography. Okay. So, let us look at uh, the various ionization techniques in grass uh, in mass spectrometer. Electron ionization as I said uh, initially uh, electrons are produced, it bombards the molecule and makes it into smaller ions. So, the analyte in is coming here, it may be coming from HPLC or LC or a GC. Uh, electrons are produced here, it bombards, so your fragments are formed here. And then these fragments are focused and sent, it goes to the uh, mass spectrometer detector and so on. This is called the electron ionization. So, high energy electrons bombard the sample. Uh, so, you get very small fragments. So, in the EI, uh, you get lot of small, small fragments. So, um, EI is not generally used for large biomolecules because if you break the biomolecules, it may be very difficult to reconstruct and tell what is the molecular weight of the biomolecule. Okay? So, that is a problem with EI technique. It is good for a small organic molecule, but generally this is not used for small organic molecule. ESI is another technique, it is much milder, it is electro spray ionization. Okay. So, what we do is <coughs> uh, solvent uh, analyte and solvent together is injected through a small nozzle, um, we apply a very high voltage here. So, the particles or the um, stream coming out uh, will be of small diameter uh, spray and it will be very highly charged. Okay. So, as it travels um, you can focus it and uh, so these are the solvent gets operator, the analyte is now charged small particle okay, which goes into your mass spec. So, this technique is much milder, so you are not actually breaking um, the uh, protein into smaller bits by bombarding it. So, we will call it a milder technique here. So, ESI is quite used uh, widely uh, especially for protein and uh, biomolecules, whereas EI is used uh, if you are interested in uh, small molecule especially in organic chemistry research. So, this process electrospray or ESI uh, we produce charged droplets, okay, charged droplets and uh, droplet size reduction. So, the droplets gets reduced, solvent gets evaporated and gas phase ion formation. So, you have ions formed here this is called gas phase because the solvent is completely uh, evaporated during this process. Uh, another technique is called MALDI matrix assisted laser desorption and ionization technique. This is also a very soft ionization technique unlike uh, EI. So, what we do is um, this is very good for large biomolecules like DNA, protein, peptide, sugar um, or polymers or macromolecules. So, what we do is we take the sample, mix it with a matrix material. It's matrix is a crystallized molecule. So, it could be 3, 5, dimethoxy 4 hydroxy cinnamic acid or alpha cyano 4 hydroxy cinnamic acid or 2 5 dihydroxy benzoic acid and so on. Okay. So, a laser is pulsed on the matrix not on the sample. So, the matrix gets ionized and which in turn ionizes your sample. So, it is a very mild technique. So, the matrix material and the sample which are ionized uh, travels to your mass spec. So, the matrix uh, gets initially ionized okay, which in turn ionizes your analyte. Okay. Um, these, so, the analyte molecules are ionized and accelerated into the mass spectrometer. So, this is also a very mild technique, um, this is very useful if you cannot uh, um, um, want to break proteins into smaller bits and pieces. Okay. So, typical spectrum if you are using MALDI matrix assisted laser desorption ionization technique, this is called a 
t of time of flight. So, as you can see we see the uh, molecular weights um, of uh, the material very clearly and nicely. Okay? So, what is this time of flight? Time of flight uh, the ions are accelerated once you form the ions you accelerate the ions it goes like this, like this, like this and goes to the detector. The time these ions take to reach the detector is inversely proportional to its molecular mass. So, if you have a very um, large um, ma massive material um, ion, it will take much longer time to reach the detector. Uh, if you have a very small mass material, uh, it will go faster. Okay? So, it is inversely proportional to molecular mass, the time it takes. So, from the time um, you get a inverse relationship for the mass and that is how uh, the molecular weight of material is detected. And this particular mass spectrum uh, is from a MALDI and the detector side is called the time of flight uh, detector. Okay? Uh, so, there are different types uh, uh, of uh, the detector side. So, one is the time of flight, the other one is called the ion trap. So, what it does is it is a combination of electric magnetic fields to capture charged particles of certain mass. So, you are interested in certain mass, you are not interested in any other mass. Okay. So, that is why it is called ion trap. So, we have the ionization unit, this could be a EI, ESI or MALD. So, ion enters a chamber. And enters it. So, we apply electromagnetic field and so on. So, we maintain ions of our interest, all other ions smaller or bigger um, are thrown out. Smaller is thrown out, bigger is bombarded and made into smaller. And then whatever is trapped comes out uh, of our desired mass range, that is called ion trap. Okay. So, we trap ions of certain molecular weight which is of our interest. Okay, all other smaller ones are uh, removed or ejected, the larger ones are broken into pieces. So, whatever comes out is ions of our interest. So, how do you capture them using electromagnetic field and so on actually. Okay, so, um, these are very widely used, the ion trap and uh, the time of flight. These are the two things that are used to capture ions of our interest. Okay. Uh, for example, if you look at this picture, this is a um, biofilm okay? and um, if I want I can take samples out, I can look at the molecular weight of uh, the proteins um, using a MALD type of uh, mass spec or I can use a ESI type of a mass spec and get a feel of what are the various uh, um, molecular weight proteins that are present on my um, surface. Okay. So, we talked quite a lot about uh, um, spectroscopy, the most important one is uh, according to me is FTIR Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and um, then uh, I just gave a brief glimpse about mass spectrometer, um, LCMS or GCMS, LC means liquid chromatography. So, why do you need that? We can uh, um, separate out the various components present and then we can find out the mass spec, uh, mass of those components. And um, how do you ionize them? We can use EI, electron ionization or electro spray. We can spray uh, these components and also apply a very high voltage so they get charged. Uh, so, that is another way. Another way is MALD. Uh, so, we use a matrix material which gets ionized, which in turn ionizes your sample that is called a MALD. And then later on, how do you um, get the ions of our interest? Uh, we can use uh, a ion trap type of design uh, setup. Uh, then uh, there is something called time of flight which uh, tells you depending upon the time uh, ion reaches the detector, we can find out what is the molecular weight because there is an inverse relationship between the um, time it takes to reach the detector vis-a-vis -vis the mass of the uh, fragment. Okay? So, we will continue more on this uh, uh, analytical tools in the next class also. Thank you very much for your time.